Welcome to the University of Waterloo's World Water Day celebrations. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm Nancy Gaucher. I'm a knowledge mobilization specialist in the Water Institute, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Water Institute. We are co-hosting today's events along with SWIGS, which is the students of the Water Institute graduate section. Our executive director, Roy Brower, wanted to be here to welcome you himself, but he's on his way to New York where he's leading the University of Waterloo's delegation to the UN Water Conference. In case you haven't heard, this is the first time in almost 50 years that the UN is hosting a conference on water. And it's being hailed as a once in a generation opportunity to advance global efforts towards sustainable development goal six, ensuring sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. The Water Institute was granted special accreditation by the General Assembly and will be sending eight faculty and student representatives, some of which have already left and some are leaving after this event, including myself. So we're gonna wish them the best of luck. So we're beginning this morning, I wanna acknowledge the territory where we're gathered today. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on traditional territory of the neutral Ashanabek and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, land that was granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, community building, and is coordinated with the Office of Indigenous Relations. Territorial acknowledgments are important because they acknowledge the many atrocities that have occurred in the past and continue to this day. They are essential in reconciliation and healing processes, and they can help us build and restore balanced relationships with indigenous peoples. Taking time to understand indigenous worldviews can also be instrumental in supporting society's ongoing trans transition to sustainability, which require healing our relationship with land and water. Indigenous peoples tell us that humans have a reciprocal relationship with land and water, that we are spiritually connected. And this is a very important distinction from thinking about our relationship as one of control or management over water. So today on World Water Day, I invite you to consider your reciprocal relationship with water. Water has given us many gifts. Water heals us, it keeps us safe. We need water to drink and to bathe. Water can bring renewal. It supports mental and emotional health. Water brings us joy through play, whether it's swimming, fishing, canoeing, rafting, and so on. So in the spirit of reciprocity, what can you offer water in return? What can you do to show your gratitude for everything that water has given you in your personal and professional lives? I invite you to keep this question in mind throughout today's proceedings. As we think about how to do our research in an impactful way and develop careers that will have a lasting impact on this precious gift from nature. With that said, let's move on with the program. So I'd like to invite this morning panelists to the stage while I introduce your moderator. Dustin Garrick, is Professor and University Research Chair in Water and Development Policy here at the University of Waterloo. He comes from the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability. So without further ado, Dustin, the stage is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Nancy, and good morning, everyone. Um, building on that really eloquent introduction, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to this event on water, history, life, and art. And we're very fortunate uh, to be partnering with the Aga Khan Museum to host a number of events that are highlighting the connection between water and culture. This morning's event, uh, Water, Life, History, and Art, will be a dialogue, and I'll introduce briefly in a moment. And there's a sister event. Uh, this Sunday, on the 26th of March, uh, at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, where the guest to my left, who I'll introduce in a moment, Dr. Giulio Baccaletti, will be featured in a World Water Day global conversation, uh, which is going to be complementing the museum's new installation on water, which we'll be talking and hearing a little bit more about in a moment. 
Uh, so I'd uh, give a chance to my uh, panelists in a moment to introduce themselves, but a brief introduction is that on my leftmost side, uh, we'll, we're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Ulrika Alkamis, uh, who is the director of the Aga Khan Museum. And uh, she is going to be sharing more about the water installation that's been developed there and the broader links between water, art, and culture uh, that the museum's installation is hoping to feature and celebrate. And doing so in conversation with the guest to my immediate left, uh, Dr. Giulio Baccaletti, uh, who is a trained physicist um, from Princeton University and has spent his career ever since outside of academia working in consulting and conservation roles uh, before uh, writing the book, which was released in 2020, 2021, Water, a Short Biography, uh, which has tremendous artwork on the front, which I should be holding up next to me. Do you have your own copy, Julia? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so someone in the audience who does have it, if you do, um, hold that up, and I recommend it highly. It's a, it's a tour de force magnum opus uh, that provides a sweep of history and the relationship between water and society. Uh, and it's a great entry point into today's discussion. Uh, so really, uh, I wanted to say a brief word before turning it over to those uh, fuller introductions, which is that we've uh, labeled this event uh, to be a fireside chat. And uh, that terminology is, is quite uh, interesting, or apropos for the current times that we live in. Um, fireside chat, uh, the first one was about 90 years ago, March 12th, uh, 1933. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president at the time, and the topic of the day was the banking crisis. I am sorry for that unfortunate association, um, but going on through those fireside chats, uh, the presidential advisor and speech writer, Samuel Rosenman, described these chats as playing an important role of an informal conversation with one or two of uh, the president's friends at the time. And the keyword was, informality and trying to foster conversation. And that's definitely the ethos that we bring to today's discussion. So we will have uh, some opening questions and remarks, uh, potentially some uh, quick follow-ups from me, but the opportunity is for all of us, and particularly those of you in the audience who have questions, uh, to engage in this discussion and bring your own views uh, to it. Um, and in that spirit, we've also um, been fortunate to be uh, joined by members of the Collaborative Water Program. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're part of the Collaborative Water Program? Raise them high and proud. <laughs> okay, so these are graduate students across the university's interdisciplinary uh, uh, graduate program in water, and uh, they've been thinking deeply around complex water challenges and solutions, how we value water, how we manage water in an interconnected world. And uh, they've uh, brought some questions that we'll be uh, building into that discussion. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to start first with you, Julia, and Julio, and then to you, Ulrika, um, to uh, ask you, uh, Julia, to set some context for today's discussion by giving us the uh, Cliff Notes version of the book, uh, just enough to, to kind of prime people to, to dig deeper. But can you give us the, the overview of the argument, the evidence, why you wrote it and what you're hoping uh, people will do with it. All in a pity two minutes. You, you know, you've, yeah. you've briefed Prime I, Minister. Well, first so of all, it's, it, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I um, thank you to you, Dustin, for the invitation. And Ulrike, it's a great pleasure to uh, meet you. And I really look forward to seeing the museum. Uh, uh, I'll go to Toronto this evening and I, I hope to visit it uh, before, I, before I speak there. Um, so um, I wrote this book Relationship is a word that's come up a lot in the last uh, five minutes, actually, and so maybe that's a good place to, to begin. It's a relationship, it's the story of a relationship that's been going on for a long time. And the two protagonists of this relationship, one is water and the other is, is us, right? So let me just very briefly introduce them. So water, I don't know if you've thought about where water comes from or why we have so much water on this planet, but water um, probably appears on Earth about 3.8 3 billion years ago. Um, we know it's, uh, it was part of the protoplasmic material that predates the formation of the planet, or in fact of our star. It was formed out of oxygen and, uh, and hydrogen. Oxygen was, was forged in the previous, in the previous star uh, of the previous solar system. Uh, it wasn't probably on the planet, on the surface of the planet at the beginning. The planet was too hot. It was too close to the sun. Uh, it would have essentially just blown away. For a long time, people thought it accreted inside the planet and then outgassed as the planet, uh, as the planet um, cooled. But more recently, people have concluded that it actually was probably brought here uh, on asteroids. 
that impacted uh, Earth not long after the moon was formed, which is a, another long story I won't get into today. Uh, but my point is, water's been around for 3.8 billion years, 3.8 billion years, and over that time it's been host to the formation of life, it's transformed the landscape all around us. Uh, and it's an incredible, uh, powerful force. One of the difficulties of having a conversation about water is that we uh, belabor under the misapprehension that water is this fragile uh, thing that we should be constantly concerned about, and there's some truth to that, of course, but water is actually an incredibly powerful uh, force on this planet. You'll know that it has a very unusual, for the physicists like me in the room, unusual latent heat of operation. It's a carrier of energy. And so, just to give you a sense of scale, your average uh, uh, hurricane, of the hurricane season that crosses the Atlantic, uh, as a thermal engine, not as uh, wind, but as a thermal engine, processes more or less as, about as much energy as the world economy does in a year. Right? And so, it's a, it's a powerful vector for energy and that transforms our environment. And this thing that's 3.8 billion years old and that's that energetic, so energetic that a inconsequential small part of its life turns out to be as big as our entire economy is the thing we have a relationship with. Yeah? Now we, on the other hand, uh, Homo sapiens, um, became the dominant hominid species outliving Neanderthaliensis and Heidelbergensis and all these people uh, about 300,000 years ago. So way, way younger than water is on this planet. And for most of our life on this planet, as far as we can tell, although it's not certain, we probably were semi-nomadic or nomadic hunter-gatherers and foragers mostly um, all through the last two glacial ice ages um, until, until 10,000 years ago roughly uh, when uh, what we call the Neolithic Revolution happened, when suddenly some of us, somewhere, actually in, uh, in the region that Ulrike is an expert of, uh, we, we became sedentary, right? First we became sedentary foragers and then we became sedentary farmers. And everything changed because in that relationship, suddenly we decided to stand still in this world of moving water. And that changed everything because we suddenly had to exercise collective agency to confront this giant that was transforming the environment we lived in. Until then, we could, you know, flood comes through, you move out of the way. There's no more water, you move somewhere else. But when you decide to commit to a place, to call a single place home, then your principal preoccupation is how you protect yourself and your community from this extraordinary force that can come across and... Uh, and uh, and destroy your house. You know, William Faulkner used to talk of the Mississippi as that river that runs through your living room and takes away the piano with it. You know, that's the feeling. It's sort of, uh, right? So it's an incredible force, and its absence can be uh, crippling for any community. If there's no water, you know, if it's green and it grows, it requires water, right? So it's, uh, it, it's a determinant of life. Long introduction to say that the book is really the story of how we started exercising that collective action. Um, and really the story of water is not a story of techne, of engineering, of, uh, of, of, of s practical and physical and engineering solutions as much as ideas. Ideas about how we organize ourselves together to confront this giant that, uh, that, uh, that transforms our landscape. And I'll close just by saying this, which is one of the peculiarities of our life today is that what I've just said would not have been news to anybody up to about 150 years ago. Everybody's life was fundamentally shaped by water. Everybody, first of all, most people lived in farms and worked on the landscape, and you know, it wouldn't have been unusual for you to wade a river on your way to work if you lived in the 18th, 17th, 16th, 14th, 12th, 9th century. The unusual thing about our life, our modern life today, in fact, the gift or the promise of modernism was this emancipation from nature. The fact that we, all of us, live in this illusion that water is just the, the set of the theater on which we live our life, or the stage on which we live our life, of the rhythm of consumption. And in a way, that illusion is now breaking, right? That's the story that we are in today. Climate change is changing that. Um, and so the book tries to reveal that, that that relationship, that profound relationship, which is a political relationship about how we act together to confront this giant, uh, is ultimately coming to the fore again. And maybe we'll get into 
uh, into this discussion as we go along. But anyway, that's the story of the book, and I recommend reading it, by the way, if you <laughs> feel inclined to do so. Thank you very much, um, indeed, Julio. And you mentioned that it's a political relationship, and a political relationship is a cultural one as well. And I wanted to invite you in, uh, Dr. Ulrika Alkhamis, who's bringing the perspective of Aga Khan Museum, many of the places where you describe, Julio, that uh, society started to stand still in a world of moving water are the cradles of civilization and cultures, and now recognize the river cultures that they've inspired in which people are connected uh, to water, not just through their economies, but through all aspects of, of life. Um, the community fountain plays a role, but it's also a piece of artwork. And it's kind of an entry point uh, to the museum's perspective. You've now developed this installation on water, and I'd love to hear, Ulrika, a little bit more about why water and what the museum is, is hoping to bring from this conversation. Yes, and perhaps just a very quick introduction to why the museum. It seems such a weird combo in this conversation to have a museum um, that has an Islamic art collection. But um, our mandate is really using our artworks as conduits and conversation starters. And in that respect, really working on fostering pluralism, alternative narratives around topics that we all care about. And in that respect, it then starts making sense. So the installation we have within our permanent gallery at the moment is water-focused. So we have identified objects throughout our Islamic art uh, collection that can tell contemporary stories about water. And the rationale about that is really to, first of all, give people an impression that museum objects and artifacts can tell any story you want them to, sell, to tell. So it's not about art curators ruling the roost and prescribing the narratives, but in our case, setting the objects free to tell the stories that we want them to tell on behalf of all of us. The rotation culminates in a contemporary photo exhibition that was done a few years ago by newcomer uh, photography students based at the museum around five of the sustainable development goals and one of them was water. So we are making the con a connection across the centuries, across the cultures, into our multicultural Toronto today, making the point for the uh, necessity to talk about our big issues together, beyond differences and across differences. And you said our relationship with water is a political relationship. I think our relationship with water starts well before that because our relationship with water is an essential one, an existential one, a spiritual one. And given the fact that we are made up of water, 70%, our brain 90%, we are of this element. And I think in our often Western-centric narratives, we have forgotten that there is an inherent connection um, that is expressed and has been expressed over centuries across different cultures in first and foremost spiritual ideas. The, the social, the political, the economic are the, that little afterwards, right? And what happened with the uh, 18th century, we just chatted about that, was that in the West there was a categorical disjunction introduced between um, science and spirituality, science, nature, art, and our relationship with nature and with water as a result became one of us wanting to control a commodity. So a distance was introduced. And what we are trying through the narratives around our artworks is to remind people of the fact that this relationship is one that is fundamentally an integral in many cultures around the world until this point. 
but also that there may be stories and wisdoms and narratives out there from other cultures than our own that could actually enrich our contemporary considerations around how we can preserve this most essential and existential element for all of us around the world, wherever we are and wherever we come from. Thank you so much. And, and I, I really resonates with me to hear about this distance that we've you know, established between us and, and water and our connections to it. And the other part that really stood out to me was how the impetus for this came in part from youth and students uh, who really recognize that distance are starting to try to close that gap and, and bring us that connection. So I wanted to move straight to uh, the student questions and then start inviting the rest of the audience to be reflecting on any questions. If you have any of those, there won't be any mic, you can just raise your hand uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get your uh, question. Uh, I wanted to start by calling on one of our students in, in the Collaborative Water Program uh, who's been warned about this, um, but I'm looking to see if she's escaped in the process. Um, Beth, are you here? Ah, there you are. Um, perfect time for us to hear from you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Maybe I'll start with you, Ulrika, and then to you, Julia. Sure, this is a beautiful question. I think it has to start with conversations and reflections. Um, in that, as I said before, we we, we see it as a separate commodity, but it is actually something we are ourselves and we depend upon. And um, when you look at the wisdoms of cultures, in addition to the ones that we have at our fingertips here through our education, et cetera, et cetera, you will probably find that um, people see water as a God-given thing that was given, I mean, I'm talking, for example, particularly from the Muslim culture's perspective, right? Everything is understood to have been created out of water. All creatures are created out of water and depend on water. And mankind was brought to this existence as a steward for all of creation. So there's an enormous responsibility with that. And when you look at how that traditionally has been handled, you will see that there was always um, a dedicated communal approach to respecting water because fundamentally we are in the mess we are at because we no longer respect water. We just see it as a commodity coming out of a tap or in a bottle, but we don't have any inherent respect. So traditionally the water was um, always available for a community as a whole and it was managed for the benefit of the whole. So even now, if you go to the mountains of Oman, just to give a very tactical example, villagers who live on the mountain uh, faces or even further down the, in the valleys, they have a system where they collect the rainwater and it runs into individual fields for a particular time of the day uh, in a way that makes sure everybody gets the right proportion of the water that came down the mountain or um, has been captured. So that's the first thing. And then really this um, realization that we all rely on each other in the way we use water and the way we preserve water. So we need to have a collective um, approach that is beyond differences and brings in local wisdoms as well as our assumed globally applicable expertise. And we were talking about this a little bit at the beginning that when you go into some of the MENA regions, which of course are some of the most arid, arid areas in the world, um, people have now realized that if they want to m optimize um, the preservation of water and the respect for water, they actually have to bring in religious authorities because from within their religious and spiritual traditions, there are many, many arguments that actually 
strengthen the cause of those who want to preserve the water. So they are engaging imams in the mosques, they are educating them about sanitation, hygiene, preservation, and the imams then from their uh, pulpit on the f during the Friday prayer and Friday sermon, they talk about these crucial uh, uh, issues and galvanize support and strengthen buy-in. So I think it really is about us realizing we are from one source, we, are, we, we can enrich each other with our different perspectives, we should listen to each other and be, be humble vis-a-vis -vis the wisdoms that come from across the world, and then uh, be committed to really making a difference that is truly equitable and um, inclusive of everyone who needs it, wherever they are in the world. Thank you. Oh, right to you, Julio. Sure, it's a, it's a great question and, and um, a complicated one in many ways. Let me just offer two thoughts. One is, in the end, the most important instrument in the just management of water is political emancipation and political agency, right? It's the participation, is being able to author your own life in a community, right? Having the power to do that. And we do that by having stories about ourselves that we can tell. You know, we have Zon Politikon, the Aristotelian speaking animal, right? That uh, participates in, in, uh, in social processes. And, and so I just wanted to give you two examples that uh, emerged for me as I, as I wrote this book that sort of crystallized this point. The first is, um, you know, I was a scientist uh, once. I wrote papers that none of you ever read and that, uh, you know, will probably be obsolete in, well, maybe they're already obsolete because I wrote them a while ago. Uh, my book, uh, you know, came out last year. I hope it will have a long shelf life. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, it'll, you know, be read uh, in, you know, 20, 30 years' time. I encountered a story uh, of the formation of Lake Crater in Oregon. Uh, it's an uh, oral story. It's told by the Klamath tribe, which still exists. And they tell of this uh, gigantic event uh, during which, uh, and I'll make a very succinct version of a very long story, but fundamentally two great gods, one from the underworld and one from the sky, fight together uh, to save the daughter of a of a, of a tribal leader, and eventually the sky winds over, throws the, the god back down into the mountain, covers uh, the mountain with a lake, and that's the origin of the crater. And the description is of fires filling the sky, etc., etc. Now, we know from the geological record when cra uh, Lake Crater actually formed, which is 7,000 years ago. Um, and in fact, we have archaeological evidence of the presence of the Klamath tribe from back then. So that story survived 7,000 years, right? None, neither my paper nor my book will ever be able to survive that long. There's something extraordinarily powerful about the stories we tell, particularly the stories of origin and the stories about ourselves that we tell, that is permanent and decretes over time and layers and ends up becoming the building blocks of identity, which are then the basis for negotiation and the basis for that political agency. You know? Uh, so that's the first example. Now, if I have time, I'll give you just one second example, which is where my book started from, actually, was from an artifact, as a matter of fact, from the British Museum. The British Museum has a sort of sinister history in many ways, right? But it's an incredible collection of, uh, of artifacts from all over the place. And there's one uh, little piece of clay uh, in the second floor of the main building, which is a bit as, as big as, the, as a paperback. So, man, it's all written in. And, uh, and this tells the story of a, of a god that uh, spoke to a man and told the man that a great flood would come and would cover the earth. And so the man should build a big boat and uh, save himself and his family. So the man builds this boat. It's very well described. It's 10 stories high. It's six decks. It's covered with a roof. It's an acre in size. It's a big round thing. And the man builds it, puts all his seed and all his animals on it and goes to sea. And the cataracts of heaven open up and the water comes down. And everything is flooded and everybody dies except for this man and his family and the boat. And then eventually, you know, he said, you'll probably heard this, he sends a bird out and the bird comes back, there's no land. He sends a second bird out to look for land, the bird comes out, there's no land. He sends a third bird out and the bird does not come back. Right? Land has reappeared, the boat lands on Mount Urartu, floodwaters drain away and life begins again. Now, many of us who are steeped in the Abramantic traditions, whether Muslim or uh, or, or Jewish or, uh, or Christian will recognize this as the, uh, as the story of Noah, 
uh, told in Genesis. Genesis is a 6th century artifact. But this thing that I was talking about in the British Museum is actually a 7th century copy of a 9th century artifact <coughs> that tells the story of this man, which is not Noah, it's actually Utnapishtim, which is a Mesopotamian uh, patriarch that's described in a Epic of Gilgamesh, a great book that if you haven't read, you should. There's a really interesting, uh, it's the first long form narrative that we have that probably goes back to Sumerian times, which is right in the middle of your, uh, of your region. And we're talking about, you know, Uruk is 3,500 BCE. And it turns out that when you start looking around the world, these stories of origin of humanity are everywhere. You know, I used to live in New York. New York used to be the territory of the Lenape tribe. And the Lenape thought of themselves as the descendants of insect people who had survived a great flood. Um, or, you know, the, the, the Cristobal de Molina was a, uh, a friar who interviewed the survivors of Cuzco, the disastrous defeat of the Inca in the 16th century. And he recorded the story of the Unu Pachacuti flood, a great flood that covered the earth and only two brothers survived. And on and on and on and on. So there's something profoundly universal about these stories of relationship between us and water and the origin of organized society. And to me, that's the starting point for having conversations about justice or about equity, is recognizing the sort of universality of our common relationship with water and the political nature of that relationship and the historical and cultural and ultimately identity, uh, identitarian nature of that, of that relationship. Thank you very much both. And I'd like to now turn to the audience and see if we have questions emerging. If you could raise your hands if you have a question, I'd just like to see how much interest there is. We might field multiple questions at once. Okay, why don't we see from the left here, and if I can ask you to state your name before asking the question. And make sure to use a loud voice so we can hear up front and in the back. Okay, I'll repeat it back then. Thanks for the question. It's a rich question, so I'm just going to turn it straight to you, Julio, to start, and if you can feed it back to the audience as well. Uh, yes, I mean, in a way, that's the crux of our predicament. Uh, so the question is uh, about recovering a relationship with the natural world that we probably had and seem to have lost. This is something that we were talking about also earlier. Um, and incidentally, we are, you know, part of the, our modern and contemporary concerns with climate change are the result of um, of the fact that we're discovering that actually we're not as emancipated, emancipated from nature as we might have thought we were. Right? The, pro the great promise of the 20th century was to completely free us from any variability of nature. I mean, we live over here, nature's over there, and we don't have to worry about it, and, and we just keep going uh, in our lady's lives. In fact, it's so, it's so um, ingrained in our life that macroeconomic models which are used to plan you know, used to kind of respond to the banking crisis, say, have no knowledge of space or geography. There's no X and Y in a macroeconomic model. There's no space, there's no geography, right? It's a kind of interesting, interesting problem. And now, of course, all the things that we built to protect ourselves and that delivered that security are starting to fail. And we find ourselves with water, floods, droughts, but nature more broadly, showing back at our doorstep and figuring out how we how we, um, how, you know, and asking us to figure out how we confront this. I, I'll just say one thing and then I'll pass it over to you, Ulrike, which is I don't, I'm a scientist. I, every time I hear somebody saying, well, just follow what the science say, I cringe, right? Because that can't possibly be the answer. I'm a scientist and I know that's not the answer because science is a diagnost it's a diagnostician's world. No? It's not a normative world. It shouldn't be a normative world. Um, so the question is really what kind of home do we want and what kind of life do we want in it? And that's really profoundly cultural question. It requires debate and requires words that we can share together in order to construct together a view of what uh, our home together should look like and how we might live in it, it may turn out to be very different. If we are asking technology to deliver us such that we can keep going exactly as we were doing 10, 15, 20 years ago without no interference, I'm afraid that's not on the menu. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, and so we need a different articulation of what our future looks like. Yeah, I would say that, you know, technology as such is not the problem. The objectives are the problem, you know, because when you think about human civilization has always moved on by discovering new things, by introducing new technologies. You were just talking about ancient Iraq, you know, the wheel is attributed to ancient Iraq, our first writing systems that then allowed us to communicate our thoughts and our um, uh, 
achievements in terms of progress came from there. So technology can drive us forward, but we always have to think about why are we using it? What are the overarching aspirations? Because you can use it for good and you can use it for very, very bad. And I think in that respect, it is a mindset that makes the difference. Because if we do what we do, if we look at our water problems in terms of how can we get more profit for ourselves? How can we project our company's success around the world? How can we carve out more areas of the world that we as one group can profit from and the hell to everybody else? Then that technology will be bad. But if we use technology to genuinely commit to sitting with partners around the world in their different cultural and social contexts and say, okay guys, what is it you need here? How can we help you achieve your way of living in a safe and sustainable and clean way? Then it can be a good thing. So I think it's really us becoming a little bit more humble, a little bit more open to the fact that there is local knowledge to be had that we can perhaps help optimize or maximize and then really um, realizing that we only have one planet. You know, it's not about us in one part of the world saying, okay, <clears throat> we need to do something here because things are getting bad and to hell with everybody else. We need to realize fundamentally one humanity, one planet, one element we are all interconnected with. And then how do we handle this together to help everyone on their own terms, in their own ways, in their own place. I think this is the only way, and I know it's airy-fairy. I'm the art historian, I can talk like this. But this is what I'm also trying to drive through, <clears throat> through our artworks. That, that we remember that there was a time when people dealt with water in in different, more inclusive ways. Because one other problem we have is that we no longer see issues in, in a, how shall I say, in an inclusive way. Because advanced science and advanced academia has put everything into such buckets now and into such specialized little niches that sometimes you, you lose the big picture because you are so focused on one particular aspect you know, and you were just talking about Iraq and floods. You know that the cradle of civilization is now drying up so uh, catastrophically that people who have prided themselves in living in the marshes in the same kind of reed houses that you can see on these old Sumerian uh, reliefs in the British Museum are now forced to leave their traditional habitat that they did not want to leave, even in the face of 21st century modernity, because there is simply no more water in the marshes where they could do their fishing or could give their buffaloes uh, enough water to drink, and of course for themselves as well, yeah. right? So is this okay or is this not okay? And what led to it? And part of it is, of course, geopolitics. It is who has the power, who has not got the power. You know, many things that happened there on the ground were not necessarily affected only by climate change, but it's now exasperated by climate change, right? What's our role in all that? So it's something that's ultimately very, very interconnected, and even when we look at a specific issue, we always need to remember that there's a whole superstructure of intimately related problems and challenges, that if we don't address them as well, then the one little well in the village is not going to make a difference. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something actually and, and sort of translate this thought, which I agree with very much, but even, it's a fairly, like for those of you who work in water, it's a, it's a fairly new phenomenon, new in the sense of decades, not centuries, that we have conversations about water that are not cultural and political in nature. Um, it's, it's a very unusual situation we're in. In fact, uh, um, you know, we started with the fireside chat, FDR's sort of uh, uh, story. Now, one of the very first things FDR did, um, 
in, uh, when he took office in, in uh, 33, I guess, is, um, is the Tennessee Valley Authority Act, right, which was, uh, for, for, for those of you who study uh, sort of water engineering, is a, is a very famous intervention. This was, the Tennessee Valley was a, uh, a very poor part of the United States. It was, uh, you know, endemic poverty, uh, silicosis, uh, malnutrition, you name it. It was a, it was a very, very uh, backward, undeveloped part of the United States. The answer to that at the time, this 1930s, was electrification, and the way to achieve that was essentially to, they thought at the time, develop the river in order to then build these dams and protect people from floods and bring electrification and, and help people sort of develop and so forth and so on. And um, what's interesting about that story is that the guy who led that was a, was a fellow by the name of David Lilienthal, who, uh, who was, uh, then became famous because he was then the director of the Atomic Commission uh, after that. And, and he was the first director of the Tennessee Valley Authority. But he described this not as a, as a technical project and not even as a development project, but as a democratic project. Right? So he wrote a book called Democracy in March, which is where our word grassroots democracy comes from. It was this idea that if you empowered the local communities with economic development, um, you would end up freeing them, you know, providing liberty to then engage in political processes that would provide the oversight of the very project that was delivering uh, that was delivering uh, uh, that, that political agency, right? So you bring these, and the, these are, I mean, today we look at this as a massive environmental disaster, you know, with 53 dams still uh, uh, cut through the Tennessee and the Cumberland rivers. But at the time it sort of worked, right? The objective was uh, human development and it actually did deliver vast increases in, in, uh, in, in, in health outcomes and economic development outcomes and the likes. But what's interesting is that it was framed as a political project, as a, uh, an exercise in political freedom. Hmm? Aside from the question of whether you agree with how they did it, politics and the objectives of society were at the heart of the story. Then what happened? Truman saw this and thought, oh, this is a really successful recipe. Um, and he wasn't able to replicate it anywhere else in the United States, by the way. Tennessee Valley was seen by the states involved as a massive overreach of the federal government, right? Because this was a federal project. And so originally FDR wanted to do many other of these things, and they never happened. It's a long story that we can talk about. But Truman saw this, President Truman saw this, and said, oh, that's a great recipe. I should send it around the world. And, uh, and so he instructed the Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation of the United States to go around the world and teach people about the Valley Authority. That's how we ended up with the Jordan Valley Authority, incidentally. That's how we ended up with the Helmand Valley Authority. That's, where, that's how we ended up with the Nawash Valley Authority in Ethiopia. That's how we ended up with the, actually with the Indus Water Treaty in many ways, although that's a separate story. But none of them worked like the TVA. Why? Because what they did is they took the context out, the history out, the people out, the democracy intent, whether it worked or not out, and it just became a technical, it just, what was left was a technical recipe that were then transplanted in all these other places. And absent the intent, the objective that Ulrika, you were describing, um, techne by itself doesn't deliver what you're looking for because really it's not the, uh, the answer is not the issue, it's the question. Who's asking the question, mm -hmm. right? And the question needs to be asked by the people that live in the place that's being transformed. That was the intent of the TVA, whether it worked or not is a separate question. But, so I think there's, there's a lot of, um, even in recent history, I think, there, was a, there are many people in the water sector that saw their work as a commitment to humanism, to, to personhood, not just to technology. And only recently, I think, we've lost a lot of that. Thanks so much to both. And incidentally, um, if you read Julio's book, you'll know that Tennessee Valley Authority figures prominently as this example of a dialectic, of a relationship between people and water over time. And in prep for today, the first thing I did was Google Tennessee Valley Authority in art because I knew that you would bring it up. And uh, do you know what comes up? The uh, classic propaganda image of the fist grabbing for the bolt of electricity. And I think that what's really interesting about this is that it kind of shows in that reach for technology, there's this risk that we may become alienated from the culture and the ways that we value water. And I think it speaks to this tension running right through the discussions happening in UN right now. In other words, is how do we know and how do we value water? And can the 
technological and economic ways of valuing uh, water or managing water be compatible with these cultural ones. So to bring in the audience a little bit more, I wanted to invite Jersey, and then I see another question. So we'll hear from Jersey and then check in from uh, those else in the audience who have some questions. Um, over to you. And a big, big part of this is, is around how that cultural um, approach and value of, of water coexists with the science and role of evidence. Are yeah. these two ways of knowing really compatible or mutually enriching, or do they undermine each other? Yeah. Do you want to ask? Oh, yeah, go for it. Um, well, it's a great question. Uh, and again, a complicated one. You guys did, uh, did a good job. Uh, um, well, so one observation is we have to be careful not to um, uh, kind of take people's culture out of history and out of context, right? I mean, we create our, we, we, have, we have the right to build our future, right? But the we is important. It has to be us and it has to be, uh, it has to be, um, uh, you know, um, kind of individuals in a society that have the agency to author their own life into the future. And so how, you know, how do you preserve, on the one hand, the ecological functionality that we know exists in these systems, which is a, is a sort of scientific statement, if you will, with uh, practices that are embedded in, in, um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in traditional cultures, for example. And, and the answer has nothing to do with, uh, you know, with, uh, with science, in a way. And again, I'll, I'll sound like a broken record, but it is a political exercise. You know, when this thing happened, you were mentioning the TVA imagery. Imagery matters a great deal to this, because it's how we construct our common understanding of who we are. And so I would say that, you know, in some ways, that's why doing museums like this is so important, because bringing out those practices and the cultural context in which they happen is essential to give them voice in the negotiations that create the next step, right? So when those big dams were being built in the 1930s, maybe the most powerful thing that was ever done to promote that particular vision of modernism, that particular vision of the collective future, was uh, done by Edward Luce, who hired a photographer by the name of Margaret Burke White, to photograph dams around the country, and she provided the picture of the first cover of Life magazine. If you go back and look at the first image of the cover of Life magazine, it's a, it's a picture of Fort Beck Dam on the Missouri River, and it looks like this incredible turret and bastion, and it's a military construction defending the country and the future from the world. And, uh, and it constructed an idea of the future and what it would look like and you know, the, the promise of progress. Right, this is the tail end of uh, the progressive era. Uh, and so I think that cultural um, content has to be brought into the discussions about how you imagine your future. That's how I think you preserve it. And then you know, the science of ecology, say, becomes functional. Right? And at the point, it's just in service of that future vision. The trouble is, I mean, I was the chief strategy officer of a big conservation organization that put science first, right? led by science. And in the end, I came to the conclusion that that was the wrong way to think about it because, you know, scientists, you know, Anna Arendt used to worry about this a lot. She, in, in uh, human conditions, she used to say, how can we possibly have a political discussion with language that people can't understand? If we're going to talk, everybody has to understand the words. And science, almost by definition, is exclusionary. Uh, and so I think the process is one of bringing the the culture that was developed by people, by humans, into the discussion. And that's the starting point for including, for finding that balance between functionality and ecological integrity and the, you know, the respect of uh, traditional practices. Rika, did you want to add? I think bal balance is a perfect word here. And when you asked the question, the first thing that came to my mind was a hadith that is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, where he says that, when you do your ablutions, do them with modesty, even if you do them at, on the shores of a large flowing river. So, modesty. Because when you think about what got us to the point where we are at here, it's excessive exploitation of natural resources in pursuit of profit and accelerated advancement regardless, right? That is what got, got us to this uh, thing. 
So if you have a river you want to preserve, but at the same time you have the reality of needing to trade along this river and carrying your commodities along the river, it is a matter of balance. And saying, okay, we want this, this is sacred to us, this is important to us, we need to live at the same time, we need to trade, we need to connect with other cultures. So how can we do this in a sustainable way? And you can only think that way if your ultimate goal is not uh, profit or, or you know, you're, you're expanding your, or optimizing your global markets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? That's talking at a very idealistic level, but it's really what do we want out of life? I mean, is it, we have come to a point where we are destroying the planet to a degree that's, that just the other day in the paper, the scientists were screaming and saying, guys, if you don't do something now, we've had it, right? So I think it's coming back to a realization that it is possible and now necessary for all of us around this big ball to um, question what we do ask what we really need to have a good life and shaving away excesses or exploitations or whatever it is, you know, and that's the way I would look at it. And again, from my point of view in, in, the, in the museum world, you can ask artworks to talk about even this excess. I have an Islamic ceramics gallery in the museum very, very uh, kind of niche. And when the colleagues came from the Water Institute for the first kind of conversations, I said, listen, we could actually do a conversation in this gallery around how much water is needed to create these ceramics. And how much water would have been needed in the 13th century in Iran and how much water is needed now for the ceramics we all buy in IKEA every day to be created um, to, to supply this mass, mass, mass market for cheap price, right? Then you suddenly realize that these challenges have always been there and people dealt with them in different ways and we have touch points across civilizations and histories where we could actually say, oh, interesting how they did it. Um, here might be something for us to pick up on. Very good, and I know that there are um, many students in the audience who have an answer of how much water is used in <laughs> these different sectors around this concept of the water footprint and the impact. I saw one question, but I am noting that we are going to be starting to run short on time. So I wanna urge those of you who have questions just to let me know so I see where the, the interest is, if I can see a number of hands. Um, and we'll, we'll start with you, um, and remind, reminder to say your name first, please. Okay, well, there's really a question for both of you in there, and um, I'd like to invite you to respond to the extent possible, maybe to ground it and contextualize it with an example. Uh, so we're gonna start with you, Julio, because water rights in the American West, uh, I can build on that if we want to discuss it. And then over to you, Ulrika, on the role of art history. Well, we have Mr. Water Rights over here, so you, know, you should be answering these questions. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot as well, actually. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's, um, there's two levels to the answer. One more contingent, which is where does the current uh, way of managing uh, water through allocations and rights in the US, in the Western US uh, go? And uh, you know, the answer obviously is, nowhere very fast, it never does, uh, you'd, you'd hope that we could graduate from a process that's almost entirely judicial to something a bit more liquid. Um, and uh, I have some hope, you know, we, uh, some, a couple of years ago, we did some experiments in trying to um, uh, bring to the table uh, environmental flows as a participant in the in the water markets of the West. In California, for example, Sigma, which was this uh, camping of the extraction of water from the ground, as you will probably well know, uh, ended up creating this opportunity where lots of people might need to get much more efficient if they want to continue to produce. And so this was an opportunity to upgrade a lot of farms and 
and say, well, if you're upgrading farms and you have water to spare, could we find a way of paying you to give water to nature, natural ecosystems? And TNC ended up doing a big project uh, with a fund there, an asset manager called RRG, uh, in trying to do that, free up water, find find what we had also done in Australia, where it's significantly easier because the market is way more liquid, where uh, you use the fact that you're trading at the margins to bring multiple uses into the picture. Yeah? Um, we could talk about that more. Now, in all of this, the level of sophistication that's required to participate in this is extremely high. And so it's by its very nature excludes those who don't have a voice or can't access sophisticated mechanisms or don't have uh, access to lawyers that are water lawyers or the like, right? So then this brings you to the question of, well, is, are we making a mistake at the heart of, at the beginning, which is kind of where I've been thinking a lot, which is I fear that marginalism is a problem in water, that the, you know, the sort of natural rights, Lockean view of, of, uh, of rights, which are essentially rooted in, you know, in John Locke's view of natural rights, is not, it's not the right way to think about this because uh, we were talking about this actually earlier, there's a, there's a collectivist problem in, in the management of water that is simply is not going to show up at the margin. Even economically, it doesn't show up at the margin. What it costs you to build the infrastructure, manage the Colorado so that everybody has water will never be paid for at the margin by whatever trade you set up, because at some point, people won't be able to afford it. And so really, it's about um, managing these resources as a, as a republic as a res publica, right? And, and that's, uh, that's a way of thinking about it that's very different from the liberal, liberal in the British political sense, um, way of thinking that would lead you to believe in water rights. So just to close, because I, I can ramble on for a long time on this, there's a technical answer, which is you can probably improve the performance of water rights in the West and get them closer to what actually happens in Australia, which is not terrible, um, although the Australians would dispute that, but I think it still sort of works well. But I'm starting to wonder whether we sort of, you know, I used to be a great fan of, uh, of markets in a way. Uh, and, and that I, is, by the way, how we got to know each other. And that's how we got to know each other. And, you know, I, I created two funds, you know, some of them very significant, that traded on behalf of nature for water, mar on water uh, markets. And I'm now starting to think, gosh, we need a thesis for public ownership. Uh, not, we are not going to solve this thing at the margin. I, I just don't believe it. Because too many will be excluded. Because it's never going to be liquid enough um, to, uh, to, to work. So that, that will be my sort of brief answer. Yeah, from the art historical point of view, I think um, it can speak of denial of water rights, but also of giving of water rights. And it depends, again, what cultural context you look at in that respect. So from <clears throat> the field of Muslim civilizations, for example, as I already said, you know, humanity in the Quran is um, appointed by God to look after the environment. So a leader traditionally in the region was responsible for providing water for people and animals to drink and also to make sure that vegetation could grow. So this is actually, um, in Islamic law, fundamentally something to, um, to adhere to. So what you see through the centuries is, for example, that there will be public fountains that will uh, are being made available <clears throat> You have free ablution water in the mosques, of course, because Muslims have to go and pray and uh, cleanse. Um, so water was, it was a duty to make water available. At the same time, um, it was permissible to charge for any uh, services that I needed to keep the water clean, to keep the water accessible for everyone and so on. So in architecture, as I said, you see a lot of that. And then when you go into material culture, um, obviously the material culture, like in all art history, actually only gives you the remnants of the elevated uh, levels of society. So what we think is world history of art is only a tiny, tiny veneer that we have chosen to collect for many different reasons as compared to the masses of the people that dealt with water in their daily lives through clay pots or clay jars, which you still find in, in Bedouin areas and where else was a Bahrain rec recently where people um, uh, you know, make these, these vessels for water consumption. So, um, but through these objects in turn, even though they are for elevated levels of society, 
you find certain attitudes towards water. So, um, for example, the, the concept of hospitality. The first thing you do when you welcome someone into your home is to give them water or to spray them with uh, rose water. Um, you might have fountains in mansions that are in the guest room. So when people come, they sit around the fountain and they act as um, air conditioning, as soothing mental health, um, you know, support. So um, you can actually tell a lot about the customs in a society through the various artworks that survive and read um, the rights or lack of rights that uh, were and are available through those. I think that's really well said. And uh, you know, someone who's reflecting a lot on this topic in the context of this discussion, I think we'll be able to find a residue of those debates, those political debates around rights throughout art history. And, uh, and that at the root, property rights are social relationships. And so we would expect them to be influenced heavily by culture. And uh, despite this era of marginalism, at the root, many rights systems are based on equity norms, which are, are, are going to be uh, illustrated a lot through this artistic record as well. Um, so I couldn't help myself by giving those couple of editorial remarks. Um, but I wanted to flag two things. We are running short on time and checking. Are we 15 after the hour or 30? 30. So um, this is going to be kind of the last phase, and I wanted to warn our panelists and um, maybe ask you that I'm going to uh, turn uh, the role to you and give you both the chance to ask a question of each other. Um, so we're going to give you a minute to think about that while I turn back to the audience um, and, and check to see if we have any other questions. I really, the dream scenario is that we've got three or four hands coming up, and we can actually field um, a group of questions at the same time and, and put our panelists to actual work here. Um, so let me check now, questions in the audience. I see one from Risa on the left. I'm going to wait until we get at least one more. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we'll go from left to right. Um, starting with you, Risa. Okay, what I might do now is just um, see who wants to volunteer to go first. I, um, to answer your question, one doesn't exclude the other. See, one problem we have, I, I mentioned it before, in our contemporary way of, of organizing academia, everything is in a box. So <clears throat> art doesn't speak to science. You would never in a million years dream of looking at um, the Mahaparata, for example, and putting that in dialogue with your research on wa water. But the reality is that um, once they were not separate. They were part of a holistic worldview. And again, from our particular perspective in Muslim cultures, an intellectual in the region in the pre-modern era was um, everything. You know, was a poet, was a calligrapher, was a scientist, was a was a researcher, was a doctor perhaps, was an astronomer, all of that. And the whole idea was that your, um, yeah, the creation that God had given you, you could only ever hope to access any of it by doing research in all these different areas, right? So that has been broken apart and thereby we are potentially missing new perspectives uh, looking at an item that would actually help us tackle the problem differently. That doesn't mean that your data are not valid. Of course they are valid. But if you then have to go to the village and convince somebody who has been living with spiritual notions and, and really deep belief in, in the, those qualities of the water, how are you going to strike up the conversation? You know, so part of this inclusive knowledge also allows you to meet the person that you are trying to help on their terms and with respect because you value the knowledge and wisdom that they have at the level of your data knowledge and high tech knowledge and everything, right? And there's another problem here that we don't normally do that anymore. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, just a, 
in addition to what he had just said, which is absolutely right, uh, you know, I'm a scientist by training, but I felt the need to write a book of history to engage the constituencies that I was talking to because I didn't feel like science was going to be enough. And it is this, it's not either or. The, 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 I think I'll answer the two questions together because in a way that's, that conversation is an example of, of your question about what are positive examples. Um, so it turns out that we have enormous power particularly in countries where we have agency, which is not everywhere on the planet, I should add. But we certainly do, uh, uh, you know, um, here, for example. And so I, when I was working in the Nature Conservancy, we had a, a, there were a bunch of uh, examples where uh, people realized, I don't think, it, you know, it's less about correcting the past and more about designing the future. Right? And the future needs to incorporate nature in a way that, you know, maybe 70, 80 years ago people didn't think was necessary. And uh, that has translated in very concrete action. So, for example, uh, you know, Dustin knows this, we worked on a river in Maine called the Penobscot River, which was a river that's 2,000 miles long, and it was dammed up all through the uh, 19th and early 20th century, mostly for milling, uh, to the point that only the last 200 kilometers were essentially connected to the sea. Now, this was a, a river that was very important for American shad and alewife and other species that were foraging fish for tuna, uh, um, for, sorry, for cod, for uh, the North Atlantic cod. And so the, the fishery, the famous collapse of the cod fisheries uh, of the late 19th, early 20th century it was overfishing, but it was overfishing on an already collapsed fishery due to the fact that we'd stopped the food from flowing into the North Atlantic. A few years ago, with the Penobscot Nation, it was uh, decided that we would want to reconnect that river. And uh, long story short, you know, we, we essentially reconfigured the river to produce exactly the same amount of hydropower it does today, but reconnected about 1,000 miles of river. And we actually physically eliminated a couple of dams. Uh, and a year or two after we did that, three million fish went through the point where uh, the dam was sitting before. Uh, and, you know, this is one example, but there have been many. There's the Elowa River in, uh, in, uh, in the northwest. You know, right now we're about to see the, uh, the Klamath, actually. Uh, there were four big dams that PG&E had on the, on the river that are going to be removed. We'll see what happens. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. But, again, that should restore, uh, restore the river for its uh, salmon run. Um, so... There are examples over the place where people are bringing nature into the picture because it's a, it's a contemporary value that people care about and they're able to reintroduce it. So by talking about it, by having these conversations, you can actually change reality and change the future. And there are many examples of that. One of them is this discourse about river rights. Uh, you know, one way in which people have argued for these kinds of reconnections has been to say, well, rivers have uh, personhood. New Zealand has done some of this and others. So I, I have two thoughts about that, and maybe you'll, you'll have some. Uh, on the one hand, I'm a humanist. I care about people way more than I care about anything else. And so I don't attribute, I, Giulio, don't attribute um, equality to things and places and species that are not human. I care about humans more than I care about anything else. At the same time, when those mechanisms where the, you know, where the choice of giving personhood to a river is an expression of collective will that's a legitimate expression in a society that's gone through a process of reconnecting with some tradition, for example, and ensuring that it's reflected in, uh, in, uh, in legislation, then all the more power to them. I think it's a healthy, uh, it's a healthy representation of uh, political agency. So the idea of personhood of rivers can't be decoupled from the context, the political context in which it, it's proposed. It's not a recipe. I am not for recipes about giving personhood to things, but I am for giving people legitimacy, legitimate authority over their own life. And if that's the product, then so be it. You know? uh, and sometimes it can deliver the kind of outcomes that we, uh, you know, that many of us aspire to, which is a greater sort of connection with... Uh, with the natural world. But I, I don't see it as a, a normative absolute, right?
Maybe I'll just add on that because in the prep for this, I discovered there is a global network of water museums, which has an annual event. And this year is focusing on I Remember Water with express emphasis of trying to reconnect us with water and the way we, we know and value it um, in part to, to hopefully lead to change. Uh, we are now really at the last stage, so I'm going to turn it um, over to, to you two to ask your burning questions to each other. And I think the way I'll do this in terms of reciprocity is let you go first, Julio, so Ulrika, you can get him back. Um, but I did want to double check with the audience to see if there are any burning uh, questions. We have a li like lightning round just to hear the question and give a quick reaction. You fight it off. I, I, um, I, first of all, I, I, you know, I'm sort of hopeful by nature, even, you know, that I come across a cynic, but I'm not at all. In reality, I work on these things because every problem we confront, we've made, and therefore we can, by definition, solve. There's nothing, that's why one of the reasons I'm not as enamored with the sort of catastrophic narrative uh, of uh, the sort of act of God uh, sort of coming down. Because we have agency of our own life, and 10,000 years of history of water shows us that. And so that gives me enormous hope. That's why I speak about this, because I think we can, in fact, write our future. Uh, you know, the West of the United States is in a mess, but we wrote those laws, you know, we could change them. Um, and so I think that's, that's, uh, that's what gives me hope, that proof, 10,000 years of proof that we have, in fact, agency over our collective life, and we can exercise it if we want to. You do, you young people do. Um, in my work, you know, I come across a lot of young people from all walks of life, from so many different backgrounds. And you already have the answers. You have to just be confident about asking the right questions, even if they go against the canon that you are being taught question, question what you are learning and ask questions out of the box. That's really super important. And the other thing I would say is reconsider the definition of the word value. Because what got us into this mess globally, I think, is that the definition of the word value was, has become or had become an exclusively materialistic one. If we want to survive, the definition for the word value has to change. And um, I see this happening with my encounters with people in the museum and again with young people who ask the right questions so very much. And I think you are on the right path and just keep it going, keep asking questions. Don't think you have all the answers because you don't, but be open to asking lots and of each other and from the cultures that uh, you will be engaging with and then there will definitely be a tomorrow. Lovely. Uh, well, let me start over with you, Julio. Um, a question for Ulrika. Well, um, uh, given that I will be visiting the museum and hopefully everybody here will be visiting the museum, uh, given the conversation that we've had, what is the one object or one exhibit or one thing that we should see and look at and help us understand what we should be looking for? I think I would turn it on its head. If you, when you come, if you come, what I want you to do is actually walk in and intuitively go for one object that pulls you. And that may be an encounter that will change your life because when you make an object, how should I put it? Learning doesn't start here. It starts here. Right? And you, if you come in and you, pull, you are pulled by one object, and it's not from your culture, it's not from your century, nothing, but it pulls you, follow that pull. Um, I had somebody in the other day who was um, from half Nigerian, and he walked up to one of our uh, 17th century um, pear-shaped luster vases in the ceramic gallery. And he goes, oh my God, I love this vase. It reminds me of home. It reminds me of our calabash gourds and it reminds me of the birds in the trees of my grandfather back home. He'll never forget that object. 
but he will always feel he has something to come back to. And I think this connection that we build with objects individually, but then also looking at them as conversation starters to share our stories, that is where the amazing potential lies. So I hope you come, you find an object you love, and you talk about it with somebody else. Lovely. Well, now turning it to you. Well, I heard through the grapevine that your book is actually two books, one of which never made it because you had so much extra material. So I would love to know from you when can we see the second iteration, which I believe uh, looks much more into the art of water, right? That, that's right. It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, writing is really uh, an exercise in so it's a very individual thing. It's about telling the story you want to tell. Then the agents and the publishers come in and tell you what people might want to read. And 600,000 words wasn't the answer. And so I had to cut it down by a fair amount. But no, I, you know, one of the reasons, um, I don't know yet when it will come out, but one of the reasons I was really delighted to have this conversation is that indeed in writing the book, in, you know, it, the, writing the book was an exercise like visiting a museum. You know, I was walking around and trying to find objects and things that would resonate. And uh, it turns out so much of it was visual and uh, were, were objects uh, from, uh, from art from different times. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just tell you one of these pieces of art just to give you a sense of it, which is a very odd choice in some ways, but hopefully will illustrate it, is um, this painting by a today almost unknown regionalist American painter called Thomas Hart Benton who uh, today is almost uh, forgotten, but he was the teacher of Jackson Pollock. That's how, you know, that's how we might know him today. And he, he was a muralist, so he did murals. Um, and there was a store in Kansas City called Hartsfeld Store that uh, commissioned a painting by him. And he chose to paint uh, an allegory of Ovid's Achilles and Heracles, the fight of the uh, river god and the hero. And he represented it as a uh, bull, and uh, two young uh, men uh, in jeans, as it turns out, that are fighting this bull, trying to uh, push him to the ground. And then there's this proleptic horn on the right with all these products that come from the land. And it's, it's a seven meter thing, it's big, it's in the Smithsonian now. And uh, what was amazing to me, that he painted this thing, and it's an allegory of the power of the landscape, you know, in the middle of Missouri. And it was in the perfumery section of Hartsfeld's store in Petticoat Lane in Kansas City. And the idea that he would draw, that he would paint this and that he knew that people would look at it and understand what he was saying uh, was really powerful to me. And that he was telling a story that had been first written down by Ovid but would have to actually dated back into the depths of time it was really, really powerful. And so I don't know when the book will come out, but uh, there will be a lot of pictures and a lot of art in it. Excellent. And there's, some, there's something to, to be said about the fact that you edited out that part, and now we've shown you the value, the, the, the hidden value That's of right. that. It costs a lot more to print a book with a lot of pictures in it. <laughs> <laughs> so it all comes back down to the economics, well, doesn't it? Uh, well, unfortunately, we have run uh, out of time, but there will be an opportunity for some food and discussion. And before turning to that, I wanted to, of course, thank our speakers and have a small token that we'd like to offer you in a moment. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a few people who've been involved in putting this event on. Um, of course, the Water Institute staff, uh, led by Kevin Beamer, who's sitting on the right uh, side for me. Uh, and uh, also the students. There is the Students of the Water Institute graduate section, um, lovingly known as SWIGS. Uh, how many of you are associated with SWIGS? Raise those, lands, those hands. Uh, I think more, actually. But, um, and, might be in New York as well. And, and in the very back, you can see Julie and Isabel. Uh, I know that they've been doing an immense amount of work to uh, get uh, this event to come off and to connect that with all of the next generation. And that is certainly what gives me hope, is the next generation of leaders in accelerating the transition uh, to you all. So thanks uh, for all of your work putting on this event. Thanks again to Ulrika and Julio. And I think I close by um, sharing with you some gifts, and I'm going to hopefully get them right. Kevin will don't now correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe this one goes to Julio. Oh, okay. um, so thanks again, Julio. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Ulrika.
Before we formally conclude, I do want to uh, remind uh, you all that there will be other activities for World Water Day here in Waterloo this afternoon, uh, starting at 1.30. And uh, again, on, on Sunday um, at the Aga Khan Museum, there will be the global conversation with Julio, uh, the sister event, and uh, urge us all to get over there and to check out um, the collection. Looking forward to uh, hearing more uh, from you both during that conversation. And uh, without further ado, um, please join me in thanking our panel and uh, you all. <laughs>